Hello and welcome to the third podcast from Dr Crunch. My name's Sheena. And I'm Viral. And today we'd like to talk to you about hyperkalemia. The format of this podcast will be firstly a case study, followed by an exploration of the causes, investigations and management of hyperkalemia. This case study was based on a true case that I experienced in my first week working as a junior doctor. And one thing I did learn is that as long as you follow a few simple uh, kind of principles, uh, it's really quite straightforward. Once upon a time, Dr. Sheena Ramyad was walking through the wards, minding her own business and loving being a doctor. When suddenly, a nurse came round the corner and said, Doctor, can you come see my patient, please? What's the matter? Doctor, the patient's really unwell. He's a 62-year-old gentleman with diabetes and a bit of chronic kidney disease. And he's coming with a UTI and general confusion, but now he just looks really unwell, doctor. Oh, I should probably go and see him then. Oh, thanks for coming outside, doctor. Oh, his user and knees are showing a potassium of 7.4. Put an ECG in place. Doctor, what would worry your ECG? Well, the easiest way to do it is to think of the ECG as being a piece of string running from left to right. Okay, doctor. Think of it in two halves, with the first segment being from the P wave to the S, and then the second from the S to the T. Okay, two segments. Think of the two segments as being A and B. The early changes of hyperkalemia can be thought of as segment B being squashed together. So in this way, I hope you can imagine that the T waves would become more tented and the QT interval would shorten. Doctor, that's genius. What about the late changes? Well, this time, imagine segment A being stretched. So that's from P to S. So as you can imagine, I hope, there'd be a widened QRS, an increase in the PR interval, and flattening of the P wave. Wow, Doctor, you're a lifesaver. I know. So were there any of these changes in the ECG? Uh, yes, Doctor, there were tall tentative waves. Oh, in that case, we need to p- protect our patient's heart. Doctor, how are we going to do that? With calcium gluconate. Ah, I see, and that will lower the potassium. Unfortunately, not. As potassium increases, the resting membrane potential becomes less negative, so there's actually a lower threshold to activation. This leads to an increased risk of our patient having a ventricular tachycardia or a fibrillation. In hyperkalemia, calcium gluconate restores the threshold for activation toward normal. Doctor, how are we going to lower the potassium? Well, there are two ways of doing this. We can either push the potassium into the cells or excrete it from the body. The quickest way is to push the potassium into cells. There are two main ways of doing this. Firstly, salbutamol nebulizers. Secondly, an insulin dextrose infusion. The second method is by excretion through the body, which is a lot slower. The first method is calcium risonium, and there's also the option of dialysis. Calcium risonium is a slow-acting method, allowing potassium to be excreted through the GI tract. Just to prove how long it takes, each gram removes just one millimole per litre of potassium, but the onset is very slow, taking over two hours. Refractive hyperkalemia is one of the indications for hemodialysis. Oh, is that all, doctor? No, once the patient stabilised, it's important to check the drug charts and to stop any drugs that might be contributing to the hyperkalemia, such as spironolactone, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Also start the patient on a low potassium diet. Doctor, the patient's all better. So, hyperkalemia can be classified into mild, moderate and severe. Mild would be a level between 5.5 and 6, moderate would be between 6.1 and 6.9, and severe would be anything more than 7, or any level of potassium with ECG changes suggestive of hyperkalemia. This patient had uh, a potassium level above 7 and ECG changes, so it was treated urgently. So what exactly are the causes of hyperkalemia? Well, hyperkalemia means too much potassium in the blood. So, this could be because there's too much potassium entering the blood, or it could be because we have a problem getting rid of potassium from the blood, or potassium is moving from the cells to the blood. How can you have too much potassium entering the blood? Well... Most obviously it could be if someone gave you potassium supplementation. However, you also get potassium entering the blood whenever cells lies or split open 
releasing intracellular potassium into the circulation. This can happen in tumor lysis syndrome or if there's any uh, ischemias, for example, in a heart attack if cells burst open. So you also get cells being lysed in, uh, in burns or in trauma, things like that. And one of the most interesting cases I think is why do you people why are people more likely to die in freshwater drownings than saltwater drownings? And the reason is when you have fresh water, it enters the lungs and then it enters the circulation. And then it causes red blood cells within the circulation to burst because of the osmotic pressure. And then this sudden release of potassium will actually cause the heart to stop. And just to illustrate just how dangerous high potassium is, the way they kill people in some states in America uh, is through the, in the lethal injection. So this is potassium chloride injected IV, and this is a pretty effective way of stopping the heart. Okay, I see. So when would you not get the potassium out of the blood? Well, potassium is normally excreted through the kidneys, and so any cause of kidney failure can potentially cause hyperkalemia. Uh, you can also get it more acutely, um, particularly with new drugs which stop the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone axis. So ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, um, and spironolactone. Addison's disease also effectively acts like a spironolactone uh, when it comes to the distal tubule, so that can also cause hyperkalemia. And uh, the fact that potassium is excreted renally means that if someone's got no urine output, you really don't want to be giving them any potassium supplements because it's got nowhere to go. Okay, I see. So what causes potassium to shift out of the cells into the blood? Well, as any listener of our series of podcasts would know, potassium and hydrogen tend to follow each other. So any cause of acidosis is going to tend to make potassium come from inside the cell to out of the cell. So any sort of metabolic, typically DK is probably the most classic example people come across. Um, in addition to acidosis, beta blockers also have the similar effect on the shift of potassium. And one thing worth being aware of is sometimes a raised potassium might not actually mean a raised potassium. Uh, you can get a pseudo hypokalemia basically when you've taken the blood sample in a funny way. So anything that's let that's more likely to cause uh, hemolysis within the sample will give you a hypokalemia. So prolonged tourniquet time, if you've had um, a long time taking the sample, if it's, you've been clenched a lot, if there's been a delay going to the lab or if you've shaken the tube quite vigorously, basically anything that could potentially damage red blood cells en route to the lab. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's summarise. What have we learnt? So firstly, hyperkalemia kills. Especially in America. So it's important to treat it as quickly as possible and then to work out the cause. Yeah, so well, if you're actually presented with a high potassium level, uh, what you we need to do is, if it's above the normal range, get an ECG on that patient. Uh, if it's above 7, then you're going to treat that patient anyway. If it's kind of a mild or moderate, so between 5 and just, just 6.9, then your ECG will determine whether or not you actually have to treat that patient right now with an aggressive regime. And after the initial treatment, the three main things to do are number one, uh, look for any potassium elevating drugs the patient may be on and stop them. Number two, to put them on a low potassium diet. Number three, to seek and treat any underlying cause. So that completes our uh, case study on hyperkalemia. Thanks very much for listening. And if you have any feedback, views, ideas, concerns, expectations, anything you feel that you'd like to share, if you like it, if you don't like it, if you're really bored, um, come over, look at drcrunch.co.uk. Please give us your feedback. We're always happy to hear from you. And uh, check out the rest of the YouTube channel. All right. Thanks very much.